quick comments on a question. Uh, the, the first quick comment is um, on the uh, U.S. role. Um, I must say that uh, if you talk about extended deterrence in other regions, uh, you see uh, the concern of those that are granted uh, this extended deterrence. I mean, you, you're coming back from Korea, so, so I was in Korea a couple of weeks ago. You, you see the concern there and the concern in Japan so, uh, and the concern in Taiwan and so on. So I think it's... Uh, you know, the, to sort of take the model of saying, well, the U.S. will do just as, as, it, as it does, uh, as uh, Carlo and Eli were suggesting, uh, is, is, uh, is indeed very complicated. And, and you have this exact same debate in Europe, by the way. I mean, if you go to Tallinn, and mm -hmm. you will have a big debate about dying for Narva, uh, uh, which uh, uh, I, I believe is absurd because uh, for a NATO country there is no doubt, uh, uh, there shouldn't be any doubt on anything, and the fact that there is any doubt is a problem. But somehow our friends in, La in Latvia or Lithuania have a point when they uh, realize that uh, Germany is not ready to support them when it comes to energy security, so what about uh, an invasion? Uh, 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 and uh, when they, they, they feel that they, after Georgia, there was this debate in, in Washington about dying on Arva, which uh, for, from my perspective was completely absurd because that's the difference between a NATO country and a non-NATO country. But anyway, uh, there is this problem with the U.S. that I think is incredibly uh, heavy uh, in managing all of this. Second, que second point, uh, and, and, and your, your views on this are, are very much welcome. Uh, I believe that extended deterrence in the 21st century is going to be very different uh, because it's much more a mix of, of, of things. Uh, uh, it's, not, it's not primarily nuclear, as, as you, the three of you hinted at. Uh, uh, it's going to combine uh, missile defense with nuclear capabilities, with conventional capabilities. Um, and it's also... Uh, extended deterrence in the multiplayer environment. And extended deterrence in the multiplayer environment is incredibly complicated. Because uh, imagine uh, sitting in an Arab seat, uh, is the US extended deterrence only about Iran, but also about Israel? I, I mean, how do you uh, manage that uh, uh, if you want to grant extended deterrence for that? Nevertheless, it's extraordinarily important because it's prob extended deterrence is the best non-preparation tool ever. It, it worked with everyone but France. But it did work in general. Uh, in, in many cases, uh, it did work uh, uh, to convince countries that had the capability to go nuclear not to do uh, so. So I think this is uh, uh, indeed very critical. So my question to you would be the issue of backdoor commitments. Uh, uh, it's very funny when you travel to the Gulf uh, to see how excited are the Gulf countries in the um, uh, uh, Istanbul Cooperation Initiative because it's, it's kind of being in NATO, you know, it's not, it's not really being in NATO, but, uh, and, and when you start discussing deterrence with them, they uh, tend to test the proposition that, uh, th does it go with security guarantees, um, you know, um, uh, to be a part of, part of ICI or part of the Mediterranean dialogue? Uh, so that's, that's interesting. Uh, same thing with the sort of strange relationship that Eli alluded to uh, with the big Western players, including the nuclear weapon states, uh, not only the US, but also France and then the UK, of saying, we buy you weapons, but um, there, and we, we, we signed this sort of a defense uh, cooperation agreement. Um, we would welcome some forward presence. And, um, and then, you know, you really have a quick sense that what they're after, in fact, what they're after is some sort of untold security guarantee that looks like uh, some sort of extended deterrence. And in a way, it does work, because if, if I take the French example, one of the reasons now in Paris everyone uh, uh, views Iran uh, as also a direct security challenge is that in any circumstances a, new, a, a crisis a, a around Iran would involve us somehow because of these uh, uh, security commitments to the region. So how do these come into play? Uh, and lastly, just to add a, a, another layer of complexity, uh, uh, um, the fact that uh, many of these countries um, um, have many options. And, and indeed, uh, Eddie mentioned the Saudi-Pakistani connection. I, I must say it's quite fascinating when you have, a, uh, as, as, as we did uh, at FRSA, an interesting uh, extended deterrence dialogue with the countries in the region behind closed doors. Uh, 
uh, at one point I raised this issue about, you know, what about this? And the answer was very telling because I was wondering if they had explored the, you know, sort of uh, generic academic question, if they had explored some sort of dual-key uh, arrangement with Pakistan uh, if uh, worst w came to worst. And the answer was not, oh, you are known, we would never do such a thing, and, and so on. It was, why dual-key? Uh, so it's another form that uh, the U.S. never practiced, which is uh, 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 buy off the shelf uh, your extended deterrent uh, by uh, being b basically being provided with uh, all, the, all the staff, but you keep the key to yourself, which is another m <laughs> model <laughs> uh, 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 where the, the reassured has the key uh, uh, to, to that. So... All, all of this to say that it's indeed very complicated, and thank you for the excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. And I think, Camille, you're reading either my mind or my notes, which so that's many of the issues that I wanted to raise as well. But, 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 but three things I want to sort of, uh, you know, throw out there which haven't quite sort of uh, been discussed uh, as well. Number one, I think, you know, we're now exactly in the 21st century, we, we're not going to be able to make a distinction between conventional deterrence alone and nuclear deterrence. It's going to be much more complex mixture of the two. So that's number one. Number two, I think the one underlying, you know, the assurance part, we, we, you know, conventional deterrence, I think, is, is a code word, but what we really are talking about are troops on the ground. So really, it's the loss of American lives which is going to force the Americans uh, to get, uh, you know, that, that extended deterrence operational, not, uh, you know, loss of German or South Korean or other lives, right? So, and I think that's an interesting element to look at when we're sort of looking at the Middle East as well. So that's the second element. The third element, you know, which we haven't quite talked about, although, although uh, you know, Carlo, you, 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 you did mention that uh, a little bit, is we tend to forget that the whole concept of deterrence was also under, uh, underlaid by security structures, the presence of NATO and the Warsaw Pact. Uh, and, you know, despite France's errant behavior in and out of NATO, but that sort of, you know, uh, first of all, kept a degree of, uh, uh, you know, sort of unity within uh, the two regimes, uh, the, 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 the two blocs. I mean, I'm willing to bet that, you know, certainly not France and Germany, but Turkey and Greece would have gone to war with each other. They were not members of NATO. But also that, you know, it was easier to signal uh, to the other side what were the red lines. Um, and here precisely, that's probably one thing which is missing in the Middle East and that you would need uh, to think about in some ways to say, you know, whether you follow the, the NATO Warsaw Pact model or whether you structure a completely new, new model which is more inclusive, but you would need to think about that, which would, by the way, have to include in, in some way, shape, or form, Israel and some Arab states. Uh, you know, and, and how that's going to work out would, would be critical. What would you call this? Because that doesn't exist at the moment, right? Just on the question of, on, on, on Pakistan, and this was very interesting, more than sort of buying it off the shelf, uh, you know, as we know, uh, there have been joint trainings. I mean, Pakistani troops have been uh, training in M1 Abraham tanks in Saudi Arabia. Uh, they've been doing this since the 1980s. So, I mean, and given the range of their missiles, uh, and, and this throws an, another interesting dimension, what are the prospects of a Pakistani extended deterrence uh, to its allies, quote-unquote friends and allies, in the Middle East, and how might that sort of uh, play out as well. And, and last but not the least, just to connect it to the other discussion we were having on the Middle East weapons of mass destruction free zone, and uh, clearly, you know, we're talking about extended deterrence in the absence of a, me a weapons of mass destruction free zone. But one thing to consider there as well, and this is where the role of the B-5 becomes important, the fifth fleet is based in Bahrain. If you are going to talk about a Middle East a weapons of mass destruction free zone, where does the fifth fleet go? Thank you. Mark. Well, as Ailey correctly noted, any discussion of this question, issue of deterrence, that tries to go beyond high level generalizations quickly becomes very messy. I'd like to make my own modest contribution to the mess. 
with a uh, question directed uh, primarily at Yair. Yair, you mostly made reference in your presentation to the two cases of the uh, superpowers during the Cold War and India-Pakistan relationship. There was, of course, another dyad, nuclear dyad, uh, which was wrought by conflict for quite some time, and that was the Soviet Union and China, which also unfolded uh, when both powers were nuclear capable. Now, if one can distill anything from anybody's experience, it seems to suggest that in, in two of those three cases, the nuclear shadow or umbrella or whatever you want to call it did not prevent localized military conflict. Um, there was, of course, there was no uh, direct nuclear exchange. Uh, there was also no general war short of the nuclear threshold. Uh, but, of course, we don't know whether that was because of the shadow of nuclear weapons or some other reason. If we assume it was because of the shadow of nuclear weapons, and therefore there were no escalation to general war, that's fine. If you think of localized military conflict and general war as a dichotomy. But what if you think of them as different points along a spectrum? And the question is, is there anything that can be learned from this experience about where along the spectrum the nuclear factor kicks in. What, uh, how big localized conflicts are permitted before they're not permitted by the threat of nuclear weapons? Thank you. Well, I want to throw in my question, and then we'll have another round. Shimon will be the first. And the question, my question is, I was a little bit surprised of the fact that there was a tendency to talk in general about deterrence, and nobody emphasized the difference between nuclear deterrence and other deterrence. And, and in my opinion, the main difference is the fact that the cost is very clear and is unacceptable of nuclear war. And in difference to other cases, we, we have seen it even today, here, when the Israeli, the possibility of an attack on, uh, an Israeli attack on the Iranian nuclear program was discussed, then there was a discussion whether the cost is something that is acceptable by Israel or not acceptable by Israel. When it concerns nuclear weapons, there is no discussion. And that is the huge difference. Thank you. So we'll uh, uh, make the answers in, uh, uh, of course, an opposite uh, order. So we'll start with Carlo. I'll be very brief, uh, to Paul. Um, you know, until a couple of months, or probably a year ago, I would have said, you know, once Iran goes nuclear, we see informal alliances, including Israel in the region. Um, since my take now is that, you know, the let's say, very cynically speaking, the good times when in certain Arab countries a leader could decide and giving a damn about what his population thinks are over. This is bad news for security policy in the region. So I think it will be much more difficult and I think it's much more complicated than, for instance, Stephen Wald told us about alliance building in the Middle East that just <coughs> facing a common threat will bring you together in a kind of uh, informal, not a formal alliance, but informal alliance would have made the argument a year ago, now I'm much more skeptical. So, having said this, going back to history, I don't think that it was a prerequisite to have NATO and the Warsaw Pact. Yeah? To have a stable deterrence relation in Europe and to have this extended deterrence. <coughs> yeah? uh, it was much easier, of course, for the US and the, and the Soviet Union to, to deal with their allies, <coughs> but if you look inside, it's basically um, it, it didn't help the problems associated with extended deterrence to be solved because through the 60s, I mean, when, when NATO changed from massive retaliation basically to flexible response until the end, until the INF Treaty of, of what, 87, the problem of the credibility of American commitment to Europe was not clear yeah, and was always questioned by the Europeans. Although we had 
the Fulda Gap, the conventional, immediate conventional in, in involvement of the American troops. Yeah, there was always this concern that at the end of the day, you know, there is a secret deal, backdoor commitment between the Soviet Union and the U.S. that if there is a nuclear war, it will be limited to Europe. Yeah? <coughs> Although we had quite stable alliance relationships, so I don't think that this is a prerequisite, and I would rule it out here in the region, even on an informal basis. I don't rule out informal agreements between two powers, yeah? but multilateral informal agreements I would rule out here in the region, even in, in uh, given the, an Iranian uh, threat. Camille raised a hell of good points, um, which can't be answered, I think, convincingly. Um, wh one is, yeah, troops on the ground would be. This is me. No, no, it's me. Another gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> that was extended. Uh... <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I need the answer again. Okay. Good. <laughs> My wife, so. Uh... <laughs> um, the, the point is, I mean, I just pick up two points from what you, what you said, which which are really crucial. Um, I said unilateral U.S. guarantees, and I focus on the U.S. because my concern is if the U.S. doesn't change substantially its views on nuclear issues in the future, someone else will fill the gap, which from a European perspective, and I would even say from, from a regional perspective, these are not good news. So I would prefer that the U.S. gets you know, back on track with nuclear issues before I see Pakistan, China, or whoever, you know, filling the, the vacuum and, and talking to countries in the region about extended deterrence. So I, I don't think that's good news from, from my perspective. Maybe others would see it differently. The next point, and uh, these are two points I forgot to mention in my presentation. Yeah, that's exactly the point. U.S. deterrence against whom? Yeah, against Iran and Israel? So will be very difficult to, to make with Israel. Maybe the Israelis are willing to accept that if you do it on a bilateral basis, yeah, uh, then, I mean, they can even give security guarantees which are not that credible, I would assume, from an Israeli perspective uh, against an Israeli attack. The other point is you could also argue, uh, and there are some people doing this to say, and this goes back to Yair, Israel is not the problem because it, Israel has sufficient deterrence capabilities. They don't need any extended deterrence. They have missile defense. They have exactly the mix we're talking about. Yeah? So why does Israel need against what will be an Iranian nuclear capability in the beginning? Why should Israel need an, a nuclear umbrella by the U.S.? They don't need it. They have a sufficient deterrent capabilities vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Iranians. This, this is a point a lot of people make, do make, and say extended deterrence is just you know, an issue to be dealt with Arabs, I mean Arabs in the Middle East and the Gulf states. I think this is slippery slope. Yeah, if you go down the road, it will be slippery slope. It sounds very convincing at the beginning, and I was always also convinced, but if you think about that, of course, it will fragment the region even more, and it will allow the Iranians to play out uh, the Arab states uh, also against Israel. So I wouldn't go down the road. The last thing I didn't talk about, but I mentioned it. Of course, the problem is, if I look at the potential nuclear states in the future that you have to you have to find a different model for Turkey because the Turkey m model has to go through NATO and there we are in deep trouble because NATO is currently as I said you know not very clear where it should go with its own nuclear posture so Turkey would be a critical case because missile defense even the naval base one I mean let's put it very clear it doesn't work in a NATO framework it technically it's difficult politically it's difficult so it's not really something the Turks will rely upon. So how to assure the Turks yeah, in the NATO framework and not bilaterally through a US agreement uh, in order to prevent them from going nuclear? So this is one of the 25 question marks I had in my presentation. Eli? Uh, I see some weariness in the audience, so I'll be very brief. I agree with Paul and Camille that agree with me in part and added some points. So, uh, one, two, um, I would point out 
that in the Indian, Pakistani, South African, French, and the UK cases, they believe that it requires their own nuclear capability to make the US nuclear umbrella stick, one. Two, that in the cases of the Ukraine, Japan, and South Korea, and so on, it requires dual key arrangements. So what happens is, to make the U.S. umbrella stick, even if the U.S. <coughs> was willing to extend it under the best of circumstances, required very special arrangements, which you had a heavy nuclear component in your possession, and in the Ukrainian case, they actually had the weapons, not the, the codes for activating them. Um, in the Japanese and South Korean case, it required continued and repeated threats that they go nuclear to make sure that the U.S. reasserts its nuclear umbrella. So that's uh, one uh, uh, a chilling reminder of what it takes to actually get the parties to feel, as was pointed out, that the U.S. would actually be willing to take those risks. Because at the end of the day, it would say the alternative is framed would, the, would we prefer that they used nuclear weapons or they acquired nuclear weapons to us actually taking seriously our alliance obligation, our extended deterrence obligation? So that's uh, uh, one issue. The second thing is, how does uh, extended deterrence without nuclear weapons or with lesser reliance on nuclear weapons look in a world in which diminishing new conventional capabilities also care? Is a particularly vexing issue which we are now beginning to see with every one of the countries that were involved basically cutting back dramatically on its defensive capabilities. And when we think ahead of them cutting them even further, what kind of uh, uh, credible non-nuclear uh, uh, extended deterrence would look like, I must say I'm puzzled, right? But number three, I think that the most interesting issue um, that we're likely to face where we in the unfortunate situation when we were trying to practice nuclear deterrence in the Middle East is that the Iranians slash Hezbollah, whatever, have been much better at, at lunch, sort of engaging in propaganda war in whatever capabilities they've got than those who are looking at them. And that is going to put a lot of people on their nerves and so on. We're already seeing how they do. They speak from both sides of the mouth all the time and, and practice this propaganda war. So I'm quite nervous about where, how one, one would have the stability and the... Uh, um, um, lastly, with respect to Pakistan, I would just say the Pakistanis have all along seen uh, Saudi Arabia as part of their extended deterrence uh, formula. Their deployment options in, pa in Saudi Arabia do not require necessarily handing over, but my more likely scenario and in my judgment is Pakistani F-16s land on uh, the tarmac in Saudi Arabia within 24 hours of Iranian nuclearization, and then they can reverse it, they can keep it, they can hand it over, they can ask for the check first, whatever. Thank you. Yeah, you. Uh, several points, uh, some of them referring to the Israeli-Iranian pure, quote-unquote, nuclear relationship, possible potential nuclear relationship, and others to extend the deterrence, and I'll also respond to some of the points you have raised. Uh, first of all, Mark, along the spectrum, where the nuclear factor plays a role, and it seems to me, and this is quite obvious, that it does not deter low-scale, low-level violence and so on. The problem, the major problem about stability of a nuclear relationship is whether low-level violence escalates, and the sides that, that loses escalates further, and then we might reach the level of a nuclear confrontation, uh, which goes back also to Shlomo's point, which is the question of cost. And obviously I accept that. I mean, my basic point is that at, at a simplistic, initial, essential, elementary level, the de nuclear deterrence works because of the costs. What I'm arguing and what I'm primarily worried about is crisis stability under nuclear conditions. And the fact that in all the three, I agree the third one is the Soviet-Chinese or Russian-Chinese relationship, in all these three, a nuclear weapon 
uh, was not used in anger since 1945 is not necessarily a recipe for the future. So this is my major concern, which takes me back to the question of extended deterrence. I agree completely that the Israeli capability is much, much superior to the Iranian one. And obviously the Israeli capability can serve as a deterrent against various Iranian moves. What I'm concerned about is not the Israeli capability. What I'm concerned about is a crisis situation in which things might get out of hand. I only refer to some of the difficulties involved in the Middle Eastern situation. I also refer to it in a Middle Eastern situation under which conditions of command and control, second stripe, and all these are blurred and not unclear, and there is a major crisis erupting. There I see, as far as Israel is concerned, the role of an extended, American extended, uh, only American, not NATO, absolutely I agree. American as some kind of a balancer, as some kind of a power, a major power, that could, in fact, limit such a crisis from developing. This is the role I see, for example, not that Israel needs a nuclear umbrella. It has its own nuclear own umbrella. Uh, the second point that this has to do with extended deterrence, you referred all the time to the European model, and this is more important as far as the GCC countries are concerned and the American guarantee, also to some other uh, queries about the credibility of American terrorists. The European situation was totally different. Soviet nuclear capability was enormous. It was a real check on the American nuclear capability. The Iranian capability is nothing compared to that. So the, quest, the problem that the Europeans kept raising all the time, whether the United and American, you know, the famous one, whether an American president will put in danger New York, in order to defend Europe does not exist in the Iranian case. Not now, but if they have long range... Uh... Even then, it seems to me that this is a very different situation. Long Therefore, range. it seems to me that extended deterrence in the... American extended deterrence in the Middle Eastern context vis-a-vis -vis Iran is very different from the European context that you have suggested. Uh, and it seems to me that coming back to the question of credibility, as far as the GCC countries are concerned, it seems to me that possibly the political culture, actually not in GCC, if GCC countries are ready to allow the Fifth Fleet to have its headquarters there, and American presence in Kuwait, and so on and so forth, so it seems to me they crossed the threshold of being ready to accept uh, domestic opposition against it. So it seems to me that this is less, uh, less relevant. Finally, from the American perspective, and I agree with Ali and you, that there are major difficulties in American ex uh, extended terms from the American point of view and so on. But what has been mentioned, two major factors. First of all, it's a major anti-proliferation uh, instrument. Were it not there, in the future, then the possibility of proliferation in the Middle East might be enhanced. Is that the only Saudi Arabia, it seems to me, is a possible candidate? This is the first point against proliferation. The second point is that it fits an American overall policy in case Iran is becoming a nuclear power, contrary to American presidential declarations that we shall not live, exist with a nuclear Iran. And this is the policy of containment in terms. Containment in terms of Iran in the Middle East means basically some kind of enhanced American extended terms. And if they get it, it seems to me that Israel must get it not because of the nuclear umbrella, but because of many other political yeah. and strategic considerations. Thank, Thank you. you. Two more questions. Shimon? You give us. <laughs> Hello? Oh. Um, two questions. Um, one is one that I think Eli Levite touched on, uh, which is about proliferation. Uh, how could uh, proliferation from an Iranian program be deterred, an Iranian version of AQ Khan who proliferates to non-state actors, and then how in turn 
could non-state actors in possession of nuclear weapons be deterred? Uh, the second question, I don't think it's formally a question of deterrence, but I think it's connected to the whole issue of how to counter an Iranian threat. What role does missile defense play in that type of policy? I don't see any other questions, so final word. Yes? Okay. Just a quick question. We were talking about um, uh, the Israeli side of things as far as the nuclear issue. Um, and Russia has been pretty loud about any action from the Israeli side. And I guess the question would be whether you would think that Russia would take on uh, any responsibilities as far as putting Moscow in harm's way if, it, if they were going to be supporting Iran. Okay. Thank you. Two points. Uh, one, just to say, I have forgotten to mention earlier, but I think that, the, um, that if one takes seriously the European lesson, which I think will be very relevant here, uh, some of the practices of deterrence and extended deterrence would involve um, um, serious discussions of um, nuclear confidence building measures and arms control um, along the lines of the dual track arrangements and things of that nature. So that's one issue. But the second, with respect to the two questions asked to me, I think missile defense would be part of it, but it would be, play all kinds of roles. Some of it would be to protect the retaliatory capabilities. Some of them would be to limit the scenarios in which the nuclear comes into play uh, and so on. Uh, and clearly to deal with situations and, and situations which are non-nuclear in nature. So it's a, it's a very complicated equation. Since we're not talking about no domes like the SDI and so on, clearly it doesn't undermine deterrence, but um, clearly would pose a problem in terms of the uh, Iranian perception of, of their, uh, the needed arsenal uh, um, if they were actually to acquire nuclear weapons, which would be a big problem because it would be a catalyst for acquiring more the nature we're currently seeing, for example, in the difficulties between the NATO-Russia discussions, but also in the U.S.-China discussions on this issue. Uh, on interdiction, I refer you to Amos Yadlin. And uh, how does one deal with all kinds of interdictions from Iran? Iran has been a big problem in whatever it tries to supply its neighbors uh, and others, and nuclear and non-nuclear alike. I'm sure that they won't be pussycats when they acquire the capabilities of one reason not to get there in the first place. But they could have caused a lot of problems. Good intelligence is number one, right, Amos? Willingness to exercise some of your own indigenous capabilities, do PSI and things of that nature is clearly a second one that would be required. And deterring them from doing it in the first place for fear of consequences is a third element. So I see that as a, another very elaborate thing, but I refer you to the real expert and practitioner here in the audience. Thank you. Yeah, you? Carlo? Just a quick word on Russia. Um, to bring Russia on board, the rationale is not to strengthen extended deterrence, but to take away a kind of ally of Iran. That's the rationale. I think it would apply the same for the Russians. You know, the same questions you could ask for the Americans, you could ask for the Russians too. But the, the, the rationale of those who propose this kind of bilateral agreement and extended deterrence provided by the U.S. and Russia, they have in mind that by this you basically give the Russians what they would like to have on an equal footing with the U.S. and the region, and, and secondly, you take away uh, the backing of Russia, which uh, the, the backing Iran enjoys from Russia uh, nowadays. So this is the rationale. If it comes, I mean, if push comes to shoves, of course, the same question applies: Would the Russians risk Moscow for whatever? Yeah. Well, now it's final. <laughs> yeah. Thank you to everyone.